Gripped by wanderlust and a passion for financial independence, 25-year-old grad student Alex joins us to discuss travel, student loans, retirement accounts, and house hacking. Here we go. Welcome to Forget About Money, where we encourage you to take action today so you can focus on what matters to you. Today, David and I are joined by Alex. Alex, welcome to the podcast. Hi there. Good morning. Alex, let's jump into your backstory. Tell us about yourself besides the fact that you're 25 and in grad school. Yeah, of course. So um, I uh, grew up in Indiana and um, have lived there a a fair amount of my life, but I also like to travel frequently too. So I've been to 49 states. I still got one left to go. Um, So we'll see if that's happening in January or not. I don't know. We're still trying to get those plans in order. Um, but yeah, just uh, grew up as the uh, the oldest child, or as I like to say, the premier child. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I feel I feel a sense of responsibility to do things and do them right, and uh, and hopefully enjoy myself in the process. What's the missing state? Hawaii. What? That's like the best state. How do you? I mean, it's not the best state. Colorado's the best state, but how do you miss Hawaii? Go. Which it's island far, are you going to? It's, yeah, it's far, far away. You know what? They um, have planes <laughs> <laughs> and boats. <laughs> Many ways to uh, get there. You can't drive, but planes and boats. Yeah, see, that's the problem. You know, I've done road trips to all the other states, and it's like I only understand the road trip sort of a deal, right? And so, um, yeah, Hawaii has just been that enigma for me. But uh, no, hoping to see if I can get out to Oahu um, and then, you know, do a little bit of island hopping, if at all possible. It is possible. They have planes there, too. And boats. So you're 25 years old and you started traveling the world at or traveling the country at what age? And what is uh, the coolest story that you've got from all of those travels? Oh, goodness gracious. So um, the first trip I went on, I think I was allegedly, my, or so my mom tells me I was about six months old. Uh, and she put me, she put me on an airplane. So not all road trips all the time. Uh, but yeah, I went out to California as a, as a six month old and then it's been consistent trips all around the country every couple of months ever since. And so, um, I guess in terms of what the most interesting or, or fun travel story would be, oh goodness, there's a whole, whole heap of them. Let me think back. I think a, a fun one recently was in September, I was up in Minnesota. Um, so one of the things I'm trying to do as I travel the country, uh, first off, is I'm trying to visit all of the counties in the United States. So uh, stopping by each and every every one, get my picture by the county sign, touch the grass sort of thing so that I've touched all the counties. Um, and so I was up in Minnesota getting some of the, the counties up near Lake Superior. And when I'm in a county that contains the county high point, I like to try and go and summit that high point. And so I was up in... Uh, up in Oh, goodness. I forget the name of the county up there. Maybe it's Lake County um, up in up in Minnesota. And we uh, or I, I started my hike, my ascent up the mountain and clouds started coming in. And I was like, ah, it'll be fine. The forecast said that, you know, we weren't supposed to get any precipitation for, you know, a- until at least after sunset should be good to go. I've got, you know, another four hours of daylight. It's an hour and a half up to the summit. And so I'm like three hours and I get, that gives me an hour of cushion to get out of there before the storm. Um, well, I make it to the base of the mountain, you know, it's about a three mile hike into the base. Um, and the skies open up, the heavens open up thunder, lightning all over the place, big proper Midwestern thunderstorm rolling across. And, uh, I got drenched to the bone man, just completely soaked. And so it was a three mile slog back through the wind and pouring rain and there are trees falling in the forest and it was super dark <laughs> and so um i would say that was probably probably an interesting or harrowing story i eventually made it back to back to my truck and you know it was like wringing out my socks and and all that but um yeah that was my first like serious solo hike as well um and so just being out of cell service range um, being on my own and what do you know, God decides to test me and, and throw, uh, throw some, some fun thunderstorms my way. So yeah, that was my, uh, that was, that was my most harrowing adventure story. I think. Were you the only adventurous soul on that mountain that day? I was, 
Of course he was. He was the only one who was like, bah, it's not going to rain. So I live in Colorado where if it if you see the the thunderstorms rolling in, you hightail it out as soon as you can because you do not want to get caught in a thunderstorm. At elevation, you can get in a lot of trouble really quickly. Have you done Mount Whitney in California? I have looked at Mount Whitney longingly. Um, so the... We're, we're focusing more on the eastern states um, now. So like, for instance, I just made the most arduous journey up Britain Hill, which is Florida's highest point. It's a uh, wonderful 354 feet above sea level. Um, so I am, you know, starting with the with the with the low high points and kind of working my way up. But uh, yeah, Mount Whitney's on there. And then, an of course, Denali. So. <laughs> so I did Mount Whitney, not all the way to the top. I'm not crazy. Uh, I did Mount Whitney just to the first, you need a, a permit to climb all the way to the top. And my husband was climbing all the way to the top with his friends. I happened to be uh, newly pregnant at the time. It was a minute ago. And I went up to the first level that you don't need a permit for. Like everybody can climb up to here. And then after that, you need a permit. And it was beautiful. But yeah, heed all the warnings with the the bear ball, the bear bells and all of that because uh, yeah, there's a lot of wildlife there, but it's a beautiful. And if you're going to go like the lowest point in California is like a hundred miles away in Death oh, Valley. So yeah. you've got the lowest point and the highest point. They used to have a, a race, a marathon from the lowest point to the highest point, And they had to stop it. I don't remember why you can look it up if you're interested, but that would be a really cool hike just several days from the lowest to the highest point because yeah, it's just right there. Head. Yeah, it is. It is. That's the, the, I've been in, I was in death Valley in May. And so, yeah, it was amazing how hot it was down there. I was like, this oh. is ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. That is the, that's the real test is, or the real uh, balancing act. You're like, I don't want to be so hot in death Valley, but I also have to go up Mount Whitney when it's not snowing. Mm -hmm. I don't exactly. think you get one or the other. How are you going to celebrate getting that number 50? Ooh, how am I going to celebrate the number 50? That's a, that's a like good what after question. that? What, what after that? Is uh, it going to start going to countries? Yeah. Yeah. Or I figured, you know, I could go to all the states, right? States meaning like, you know, go to the Mexican states and the Brazilian states and, you know, <laughs> find all, all of the sub, sub national polities that are called states and, and start visiting those. But um, yeah, I don't really really know what the the next mountain to climb will be after uh after completing that goal Ooh, that was a good joke well i don't know what uh i don't know what the stats are as far as how many people your age have actually traversed and visited all 50 american states but that's a pretty big accomplishment i know i have not done that and i'm slightly older than you are and so congratulations and i look forward to hearing about more of your adventures and you I did all this while going to grad school Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. I opened up a map to look and I was like, I think there's maybe five I haven't done. I am also slightly older than you, Alex. <laughs> well, come on. What do you got? What do you got left, Mindy? Where Where are we going? Uh, North Dakota, Alabama, Louisiana. Um, I just closed out the map. Al Alaska. Uh, there was one other one. Uh, West Virginia. All right. Tell you what, Mindy, I'll stop by Colorado. Come uh, pick you up. We'll go right up to North Dakota. So I'll take you to North Dakota if you take me to Hawaii. How's that sound? Oh, that sounds great. <laughs> That's a totally fair trade. <laughs> You're going to love Hawaii. <laughs> I was just there for three weeks this summer and it was amazing. Kauai is our favorite island. I've only been to Oahu, but I've been there a number of times because in the Navy, when you leave out of San Diego, you usually stop in Hawaii for a couple of days. So I've oh, gone on a couple of Hawaii trips that way, probably five or six, and then another two or three just for personal vacationing. But I've only gone to Oahu, so I know there's a lot more to explore in Hawaii. So in your one trip there, you probably see more than I have experienced. <laughs> Don't feel bad, David. And what are you studying in grad school? Yes, sir. So um, I'm working on my doctorate in plant health. Um, so looking at um, basically different... Uh, production methods, right, and getting a better understanding 
of modern agriculture and sort of the inputs that we use to produce the, the produce that helps feed the world. Is weed legal in Indiana? Is weed legal? Uh, hemp is, <laughs> um, but no, we well, are that's a God not the same state. thing. <laughs> that's not the same thing, Mister Plant Man. <laughs> Those yeah, are two very separate. Yeah. So I'm in Colorado. We were the first state to legalize it. Um, it's not my thing, but I don't care if other people do it. Like decriminalizing it was great because now we don't have to deal with all that stuff. But uh, yeah. Um, Hemp being legal is fabulous. It should never have not been legal just because it looks like something doesn't mean it is something. It doesn't make you high. And there are so many awesome uses for hemp. 100%, 100% now. But uh, I think it's going to be a little while before the the great state of Indiana um, takes any of those steps because uh, it was just a couple of years ago that we legalized alcohol sales on Sunday. Um, So it's going (laughs) to, it's going to be, it's going to be a little bit. That is. Not the subject of this podcast, so I'm just going to skip my thoughts. Uh, When will you graduate? Yeah, so right now I'm anticipating uh, graduation in December of 2025. Um, Now, of course, it could go a little bit faster than that, or it could go a little bit longer, but at most my program should take three years. So, um, you know, at very worst, be completed in 2026. And where will you live after graduation? Oh, that's a that's a great question. Um, so ideally, I'm trying to find uh, work opportunities that are more location independent, right? So I would prefer to be living somewhere in the upper Midwest in the Great Lakes, somewhere like that. Um, but with the understanding that when working in international trade, um, and working in more large scale projects with agricultural policy, um, I might have to be in Washington, DC, um, or in some global city of, of that that nature. Um, So not exactly sure where I'll end up, but striving to to live near my Great Lakes because they're great for a reason. They are great for a reason. Uh, So the reason that I ask where you are going to live after graduation is that is going to significantly impact your ability to generate savings, which can lead to investing, which can lead to wealth. And knowing that you wanted to get into policymaking, that's a Washington, D.C. thing. We have a form for people to fill out if they'd like to be on the podcast. And one of the things that you said you wanted to do was purchasing a purchase a multifamily home to eliminate your monthly housing expense. This is called house hacking. And essentially, you buy a property that has more space than you need, and you rent out the extra space. If you're living in Indiana, this has you have a lot of opportunities for this. There's a lot more uh, small multifamily properties. If you're living in Washington, D.C., there's almost no opportunity for this. Not saying there isn't any opportunity for this. And if you do live in Washington, D.C., I have a rock star agent to recommend for you. Uh, But... Washington, D.C. is also a high cost of living area. Indiana is more of a low or medium cost of living area. So your money's going to go further. If you could be location independent, even if you had a job in Washington, D.C., but you didn't have to go into the office all the time, you could technically live in Indiana, the lower cost of living area, while every once in a while flying to DC if you had to. That gives you the DC paycheck with the Indiana cost of living. So that is something to keep in the back of your mind once you're graduating and looking at job offers. I think a lot of people get kind of sucked into the, ooh, Washington DC is way more exciting than Indianapolis. Well, maybe, but you know what? It's also way more expensive. Indianapolis has a lot to offer. Uh, I've got a friend in Indianapolis that I will introduce you to as well, who is a real estate investor there, and she can help you find a great agent, connect you with um, contractors, and really give you the lay of the land if that's where you end up, Um, unless you already know about Indianapolis, and then never mind. But there are a lot of benefits to working remote. If you can do that, if you can, you know, choose a job that allows you to work remote. So keeping that in mind in the back of your head once you graduate is a is something I want you to do. Uh, let's look at your money situation right now. 
what are your what is your income? Do you have any income? And what are your expenses? Because I know you have expenses, even if you don't have any income. Yeah. So um, right now, um, just uh, doing a little bit of part time work. So making about fifteen hundred dollars a month. Um, and right now, my expenses uh, when I added them up over the last couple of months and averaged them out uh, are about twenty one hundred dollars a month. Um, so there's a little bit of a of a delta in there. Um, but should be changing here in a couple of weeks uh, when I start working uh, a new job here. Okay. So what I like, uh, I, I I don't love these numbers because you should never have expenses that are more than your income. However, you're in grad school and it doesn't make any sense to work full time and let your studies suffer. So what I like about this is you said, my expenses, I added them up and then I averaged them out. That means you're keeping track. That means you're conscious of at least where your money's going, even if you can't really control it so much because it, I mean, you have to pay rent, you have to eat, you have to keep the lights on. So I like that you are keeping track and are conscious of what's going on. Uh, What about your net worth? Do you have any money? Uh, Yes. So uh, thankfully, not all months are are like this month, um, and I have been able to accumulate some savings. So, um, you know, I've got about twenty grand in in cash uh, saved up, uh, and I have an additional twenty three, twenty five grand um, in retirement accounts. That's awesome. You have t- uh, what kind of retirement accounts are those? Uh, so it's in a Roth 403b uh, in a mix of international and domestic large cap index funds. International. Wow. Okay, I'm impressed. This is this is awesome. Uh, David, you want to jump in here with any questions? Do you have any questions? I'm kind of hogging him. Uh, and as far as debts, uh, student loans, any? Yeah, so uh, currently I've got roughly sixteen thousand um, dollars in one student loan um, out from the federal government. Okay, is that are you going to be one of the lucky like ten percent who's going to benefit from whatever just passed uh, uh-huh. to get? Pro- probably not. A lot of people think that uh, if you don't know, uh, I don't know if it's actually passed or about to pass. But you know, Biden tried to get a much larger sum earlier in a, in his office, but uh, that got shut down. So I think they just passed something where a fraction of the original amount is actually more likely to get approved or is already approved where if it's a like if you worked and paid your worked for a government job and paid your loans for 10 years it would get the rest would get paid off and that's one of the group there's a few other groups that it affects so it's probably not likely uh, that it's going to affect you but definitely look into it maybe yeah. it will i think uh, you said 403b so i'm thinking teacher or teaching is that how you earn that uh, that money, yeah. So that was uh, in my capacity as a, as an instructor at the university um, and as a as a researcher. So so maybe there is something there to you can benefit from whatever laws or whatever's being signed. But we'll see. But either way, even if it's not sixteen thousand in in student loan debt is not that great. Do you expect to incur additional debt through your remaining uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Was it, two not years? Not that not that great. Meaning he's not doing a good job or not that great, meaning not that great. Oh, no, I meant that if I said not that great, I mean, it's not that bad. Sorry. Yes. I think 16,000 is not a whole lot uh, compared to some stories we do here. Uh, And you're already in grad school. So you've, you've come undergrad and now you're in grad school and you've done all that. And I know I'm saying only ideally zero, but only $16,000 in debt. It's not a bad deal. Plus the 20,000 in cash. mm Mm-hmm. To cover that, if he wanted, like he doesn't have any debts, essentially, he could just wipe that out and still have $4,000 in cash and the 23000 in the Roth 403B. And it's a Roth 403B, meaning he already paid taxes on it at his current low income level. So right, which is probably no taxes. So right now he's putting in money that's already taxed. It's going to grow tax free. And when he starts taking it out at whatever age he decides to take it out at, he's not paying any taxes on that. It's like, you know what you're doing, Alex. Why are you calling us? <laughs> I yeah, think well, I think it's good to get uh, additional perspectives on uh, financial plans. And, uh, you know, I figured y'all would have some, some great wisdom. And so it would be good to, uh, to talk about some of, uh, some of the things that I'm doing and see if there's, there's any shortcomings that I could overcome. 
Can you tell us your thoughts about whether or not you would pay use your cash to pay that off? Or do you have any, what, I mean, clearly you see those two numbers, one's in the plus and one in the negative. And if you're a numbers person, you always like, okay, what if I did just pay it off? What are the pros and cons? Tell us what you, how you thought about that or how you continue to think about that. Yeah. So I strive for simplicity whenever possible, right? So it does take a little bit of extra cognitive bandwidth to maintain that I still have an outstanding debt. Um, however, it is worth it for me um, to keep that debt around because currently that debt is financed at about 5.2%. Um, and I've got most of my cash in a high yield savings account that's at about 4.2%. So there's a 1% annual difference between the two of those. And so in effect, I'm paying $160 annually in sort of an opportunity cost money uh, to have access to that $16,000. And when I think about the rates of credit currently, right, high interest rates with mortgages, with credit cards, um, what have you, for me, I'm comfortable paying that $160 insurance premium, if you will, uh, to keep that cash on hand. To deploy towards whatever I need. So if my car ends up breaking down and I got to, you know, send it to the scrapper, no problem. I can just pay cash out of that and, and use that. No issue. Um, or, you know, if an opportunity arises for me to maybe get into some sort of an investment property, you know, do that house hack a little bit earlier than anticipating. Um, it's a lot easier to take the cash that I already have sitting in my bank account, uh, then wait another six months of savings while trying to work and build that up. Um, and so I am willing to take that that little bit of a interest rate hit uh, to maintain that additional cash reserve at the moment. Um, now, if I were to get a, a full paying job that you know big bucks start rolling in, yeah, sure, I'll I'll take that out in a in a heartbeat. But right now, where I'm at in grad school, it just makes a lot of sense for me to keep that big cash cushion available uh, for any opportunities that may arise. Yeah. So right now that's effectively serving as your emergency fund, I would imagine. Correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. I think uh, I think your thinking is spot on. What do you think, Mindy? I think that it, it, you're using the word think. He has thought about this. He has given this some thought, obviously, which is the most important part. I love that. And you're not just doing whatever. You're not just letting life drag you along or, you know, making decisions on the spur of the moment, you're giving them a lot of thought, and that's going to be very important in your financial future. Uh, what is your income trajectory? Yeah, so uh, here in the next couple of months, I'm anticipating my monthly income should come up to roughly four thousand dollars a month uh, when we include income from teaching. Um, in addition, I may pick up some some tutoring as well, um, and then I've got some scholarship funds that should be coming through as well. Um, but then when we think more large scale, um, sort of going through the pipeline, uh, that's where things get a little bit more ambiguous for me, right? Because I'm not on a traditional career path, if you will. Um, there's not a lot of people doing the sort of things that I'm interested in, in doing with my life. But if I were to take a guess, um, I would anticipate my salary being somewhere in that low six figure range uh, to start out. Um, just because of the, uh, the technical knowledge and expertise that I could provide, uh, to a potential employer, uh, on completion of my graduate studies. Ooh. So when you complete your graduate studies and you start looking at job opportunities, I want you to look at the benefits offered and look at the 457 plan. This is an opportunity, this is a, a retirement account for government workers, teachers, public public servants sort of thing. And not every public servant has this plan available. The millionaire educator has a whole, like he's made this 457 plan his life. And he has a whole uh, series of articles about it. Essentially, a 457 plan is similar to the 403B or the 401k. It has the same contribution limits of uh, I think in 2023, it's 22500 And in 2024, it's $23,000. But the 457 is also available in conjunction with the 403B or the 401k, which means you can contribute twenty two five to the one plan, the 403B, and twenty two five to the 457 plan, 
for a grand total of, David, can you do the math? I cannot. $46,000. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. And, but wait, there's more. The 457 plan is, uh, it's it's this, it, it comes with a Roth option and a traditional option. So you're either paying taxes going in or not paying taxes going in. Uh, if you're not paying taxes going in, you are reducing your taxable income, which is awesome, not paying taxes on it, or you're paying taxes going in with the idea that your income is going to get greater. Um, you Should you separate from that job, you have access to the 457 money, only paying the taxes on it if it was a, a non-tax, a tax-free account. Uh, you don't pay fees. So if you withdraw early from your 401k, you have to pay a penalty of 10% plus the taxes on whatever you pull out. With the 457 plan, you're only paying the taxes if you go the non-Roth option. So when you are looking at jobs and talking to you, you're going to have multiple opportunities available to you. You're going to go in an interview and they're going to be like, yeah, we want to hire you. And they're like, hold up, I've got 47 more interviews. So you'll get 46 job opportunities because the one person's going to pass because they're morons. And then you're going to have to sort through them. It's not just salary. There's also benefits available. And if you have a 457 plan available, you're used to living on less money, significantly less money than this low six figures you're talking about. Having the available, having the, the opportunity to throw money into the 457 and the 401k could blast you into the wealth stratosphere. Now, you only can spend a dollar once. So you can't invest in the 457 plan and invest in the 403B and then also use that money to buy a house. So you have to pick where you want your money to go. But that 457 plan, you can pull that money out once you separate and go buy a house. There's a lot of opportunities for the 457 plan. What the millionaire educator does is he contributes to the 457 to reduce his taxable income. He maxes that plan out first and then puts it into the 403B because he doesn't have the, uh, the, the 403B is like a 401k. You pull the money out, you have to pay taxes and fees. So he pulls, he puts all his money in the 457 and the 403B that he can and then When he leaves that teaching job, he'll pull the money out of the 457 to live off of. So now he's paying a lot less in taxes because he's only paying what he needs to. He's only pulling out what he needs to, to, to live off of. So that could be a fun little hack as well. And that, let me look up his website. I don't know if it's the millionaire. How do you spell that? Educator. He is millionaireeducator.com. Okay. I would like to commend you because you are 25 and you've already set yourself on a path. You're saving. You already have savings. So you you already have that habit down. You're thinking about the future. And this is in a much better situation than if you waited until you were 30 or 35 or 40 or 45 to get going. You don't have that big of a hole to dig out of, which you probably would statistically if you did wait much longer uh, to get those good habits. And you said you mentioned your four thousand dollars a month. That's roughly you know fifty grand a year. And even on that, starting when you're starting is let's say you never did. If you never got a more income is always better. But if you never got that increase in income, that you very likely will, and then in the next few years, that's still a good chunk of change. And because you're starting so early, you can you can do big things in your retirement accounts and shave years and years off of that traditional sixty five year old retirement date. So congratulations. Thank you. Now, what kind of house hacking are you looking at? And and with the market the way it is right now, would you buy a house right now? Mindy, this is since you're a realtor and you're knees deep in this housing market. uh, As a buyer, I have a lot of hesitance, uh, hesitation about buying a house in this market. I rent right now in in San Diego. I know every market is local, but uh, there's a lot of headwinds I see in the housing market right now where numbers just don't add up, whether to be buy a rental property or to uh, to house hack maybe. So what are you thinking? Are you waiting for certain things to happen in the housing market for check all the blocks for you to actually make a purchase? Um, So in terms, this is what I'm thinking about when when it comes to the purchase of a a primary residence. Um, So 
in the Midwest, we still have some properties that, believe it or not, still hit the 1% rule on face value, even with the horrendous interest rate environment. Mm -hmm. And so when I hear people complaining or, you know, sort of coming up with ideas that, oh, houses aren't affordable or we can't get into this. I'm going, okay, this looks like a good opportunity for me to get in here um, while there's people who are stepping out of the market themselves um, with the acknowledgement that it is slightly more difficult than it was when money was basically free three years ago. Um, and so sort of my my thought going into this is, so I'm, I'm paying a certain amount of in rent, okay, every month. And that's that's money money out the door. Um, but for that, I get a guarantee that that's the highest that my housing expense is going to be. Um, and I get a sort of freedom from responsibility for taking care of the physical environment. Um, however, I've noticed in all the properties I've rented, I've usually returned the property uh, to the landlord in better condition than when they gave it to me, uh, just because I like things to be nice and put in their proper place. Um, and so, you know, when it comes to uh, doing touch up paint, paint jobs, um, when it comes to deep cleaning, when it comes to working on some of the facilities and doing the maintenance um, on the properties that I've rented, I'm starting to go, hey, wait a second, I'm putting in more love, care, time and attention into these properties. And I would appreciate if I were the owner of these properties so that I could reap some of the benefits of uh, taking care of those. Um, and so when I'm looking at properties near me, um, I'm seeing some houses go on the market in, you know, the 130s to 160s range um, for a 3-1, sometimes a 3-2, but those are getting kind of sketchy. Um, and housing laws are such that you can have three different last names uh, within a property, right? And so my thought being purchase the home, get two roommates in there with me um, in the single unit um, <clears throat> where this starts to get more complicated for me and where I would like some of y'all's in, insight is when thinking about multifamily properties and qualifying for loans specifically. So with my more limited income now, I anticipate that it will be difficult convincing a bank uh, that they should lend me money despite my I guess, comfort and ability to manage my finances. Um, I, I feel like it'll still be a little bit, little bit difficult um, to, to convince them without the W-2 income because they've got their formulas and they've got to sell their loans onto, you know, Fannie Mae or whatever. And so they got to check the box. And so I need to help them check the box. And so one of the things I wanted to ask you about was with multifamily, how much could I use the projected rental income, uh, either from potential roommates in a single family home, right? Just one address per plat or, in a multifamily, you know, say we're talking about a fourplex, so the three other units, if, you know, I can't count my own, my own renters, how much of that can I use uh, to count as my anticipated income as a first time home buyer? Well, those are a lot of questions. Um, first of all, three different last names in a property, buy a five bedroom house and change your na last name to Smith and only rent to people whose last name is Smith. Problem solved. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you can typically take 75% of the rent. So you're renting $1,000, $750 of the rent and count that towards income to help you qualify for the loan. Uh, there are different rules around multifamily versus your own property. So there's a couple of different ways to house hack. One is to buy a larger house than you need, a five bedroom house, live in one bedroom and rent out the other bedrooms. Another way is to buy a small multifamily, a duplex, a triplex, a fourplex. All of these properties can be purchased with a residential as opposed to a commercial loan. So anything under four units and under is a residential loan. So you buy uh, that and then you live in one unit and you rent out the remaining units. Um, with those, it, uh, so if you, if you rent out the, the one house and you're renting out rooms, I think you have to have them rented out for a year that's called stabilizing the property before you can count those rents. Um, but again, you check with a, uh, a, a lender, they'll be able to tell you exactly what they're looking for. Uh, with the multifamily properties, I believe you only have to have a signed lease. 
So that's that's a different um, that's a different amount of commitment. Uh, so there's there's that. Um, I would absolutely encourage you to call up a lender because right now demand is down. We are recording this in the middle of November. We're getting ready to hit Thanksgiving and Christmas. This is literally the slowest time of the year. Find a lender local to you and call them up and pick their brain. Ask them a bunch of questions. Tell them, I'm just getting started with my house search. This is where I'm at. What do I need to do to qualify for a loan? They might just look at you and say, there's no way we'll give you a loan. Great. What would change that outcome? Because I'm going to be honest with you. You're 25 years old. That's a check against you. You Because you don't have the income history. You don't have any income history because you're still in grad school, which doesn't make you a bad person. It makes you a risk in the bank's eyes. If you don't have a job, that makes you a risk in the lender's eyes, which is so stupid because <sighs> don't even get me started on that. I'll just say it's stupid and be done with it. Um, if you have the money to pay back the loan, what does it matter if you have a job or not? Anyway, there is a phrase right now that I'm hearing from a lot of real estate agents. It's marry the house and date the rate. And I, I think it's so stupid, but what it means is buy the house now, commit to the house now, but don't commit to the rate. You, you get a rate. And then when rates start dropping, you look at what makes sense to refinance. So if you think about it, we have a, sh- a housing shortage. In 2008, we stopped building houses. 2009, 10, 11, 12, 13, even into 14 in some places, 15, we weren't building houses. So there's a huge shortage over several years of not building. It's not going away anytime soon. I was just at the Bigger Pockets conference and Dave Meyer, the data analyst, gave this awesome slide. He said, the impact of higher rates has demand down 40%. 40%, that's huge. But supply is at all-time lows. Supply is down 45%, which means the prices are up 4%. And he, this is based on data. This isn't based on just his gut. Uh, we are 50% down from on home sales from July of 2021. This is huge. What this is saying is there's going to be pent up demand. It's it's pending up right now, penting up right now. I don't know how to say that. Uh, accumulating. But, <laughs> yeah, it's accumulating. What a better way to say that, Alex. Thanks, thanks for showing me up, Alex. <laughs> but it's it's like it's gurgling right now. People who don't want to have a seven percent mortgage rate, people who can't get over the fact that interest rates are 7% or can't afford a 7% mortgage rate payment aren't buying houses right now. So if you could swing it, maybe you could get a co-signer. Maybe you could get a job that pays more. Maybe you can find a lender who will lend on 75% of rents. There's a lot of maybes out there that could allow you to get into a house now. Once you own the house, you're the only person that is bidding on that house when it comes to refinancing. But once mm-hmm. rates come down, and there's a lot of talk that around 5% is when demand is going to skyrocket again. So once rates come down two percentage points, uh, rates are just going to, or demand is going to go through the roof. But demand, the law of supply and demand says that when supply is low and demand is high, prices go up. So we're still in a low supply situation where that's not going to change for years because it takes a long time to build houses, to get a development approved. And not only did they stop building, they stopped planning. So now we've just started planning again. All of those houses are already sold. I mean, you go to a new build and right now there's, there's still houses available, but once those rates come down, they're all sold again. So if you can get yourself into a house now, when the rates come down, you're going to be able to refinance without the bidding war. 
But if you can't get into a house until rates come down, if they come down, there's no guarantee they're going to come down. But if you can't get in until rates come down, when they come down, if they come down, you're going to be competing with all these people who are who have been waiting because they didn't want to, couldn't get over themselves, or just simply couldn't afford it. So that's what marry the house, date the rate means. Uh, do you have any opportunities to get a cosigner? Um, that's something I haven't quite explored yet. There's some people I would be comfortable in asking and, and talking to about that. Um, but my question, I guess, is more on the risk perspective, right? Because it's going to take for me to put a down payment on a house, right? So let's say, you know, I get a, uh, like a conventional loan with the the 5% down, sort of a conventional loan. Um, so on a what $150,000 house, that'll take most of my cash savings, right? And that'll have to go in and with closing costs and all that, most of that's going to be deployed. Um, you know, most of that buffer that I have currently is going to be deployed there, leaving me with just my Roth accounts um, as sort of a cash cushion. Um, but then also my roughly $4,000 a month in income plus the additional uh, rental income that I anticipate getting. From a risk perspective, Mindy and David, what are your thoughts on you know, the purchase of a home with that capital, with the understanding that that would be eliminating my housing expense and taking about $800 of my monthly expenses, you know, off the ledger line or moving that towards a, you know, an asset that I can recoup some value on. Well, I think that everything has pros and cons. And that's why you're asking this question. So once you put your money there, then you're not putting it into, maybe you're not maxing out based on your income. Maybe you're not maxing out your 403B or 401k or whatever it ends up being that you have. That's the opportunity cost. So. <clears throat> Not only that, <clears throat> you're mid twenties. When you get through grad uh, grad school, you'll be twenty eight. Uh, are you really going to be wanting to live with two or three other people? That I would say is much bigger than people realize because you just can't leave. Uh, I I look at my home as like my domicile. Like it's like that's where I want to feel the most comfortable. And if there's uh, a visitor, or if there's a na- whatever it is. It, it seems to be magnified. And then I don't want any potential negatives in my home because that's supposed to be where I feel the most comfortable and expect to be because it's my home and I'm paying for it. And that's where you spend a lot of your time. But if you have roommates who aren't ideal, or even if they are ideal, you still have roommates. It's a distraction. It's a consideration. It's mental bandwidth and maybe even emotional bandwidth that you've got to worry about. Those are all the costs that people just don't assume. At the, at the before they make these decisions. So I would say absolutely give it more consideration. Now, if the numbers are overwhelmingly in favor and you have an out, what's your out plan? Are you, you can do this for five years and then run out or two or three years or whatever the maybe minimum requirement per loan for your loan agreement is. And then go buy a primary residence just for you and potentially a growing family who knows what your future holds. Or maybe you decide you want to travel more because that seems to be in your blood and your spirit. And if that's the case, then maybe house hacking in this way is would be a good thing for you because you are might be gone often, especially if you find a job that you can work remote. So all of those considerations, I would say do not downplay living with other people at a particular age uh, because I don't find it that fun. And uh, there are definitely pros and cons, but when you, when you have enough money and when you know you're on the right trajectory to get to your financial goals, sometimes it's not worth certain things in your life to put up with because you are, you know, you're going to make your goal. Who cares if it's one more year? Who cares if it's six more months? Who cares if it's two more years? If it costs your happiness now, just don't do it. That's an interesting thought. My thought is the other way. You're, are you, do you have roommates right now, Alex? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> what a definitive I, answer. <laughs> I'm in between housing. So, uh, I'm not, I'm not in a fixed place right now, but I have had roommates for the last seven years. Um, I like having a lot of people in my home. I like having a lively house, uh, though it comes with the, the negatives. I grew up in a big family. And so having lots of people all around all the time is something that I enjoy. Um, so I prefer having roommates uh, when possible. Um, so I anticipate here uh, when I move into a, a new place in the new year um, that I will uh, have roommates. Okay, so you have a different outlook on sharing your space than David does, and that is a positive for you and your house hacking 
uh, aspirations because you have never lived alone. And David's right. Solitude is fabulous. But if you don't know about that, you can really jumpstart your wealth building journey by having roommates and taking that giant expense off the table. And just because you have roommates now and, you know, the first couple of years after you graduate doesn't mean you have to have roommates forever. You can have roommates for a few years, really pay down that mortgage or, you know, pay off your student loans, save up a huge nest egg, whatever it is that you want to do. Stay there for a year, bounce out of that house into another year, turn that into a totally rental and, you know, do it again and again and again and build up a rental portfolio and then decide that I'm going to buy my own primary residence and have some solitude. And, you know, there's a lot of opportunities, but when you have low expenses and you've taken this giant expense off the table, you just open up so many more opportunities for you. So uh, I think it is totally doable to have roommates for a few years. I think it's a great idea. Uh, don't listen to what David said about having his own space. Uh, David's an old, David's an old man, grumpy Imagine. old man. Mm-hmm. Um, I would just caution you to not purchase any property that you can't afford to foot the entire mortgage by yourself for multiple months. If you're renting out of uh, you know rooms and all of a sudden your roommates flake and you only can pay the mortgage when you have roommates, you're putting yourself in a precarious financial position. But if you can afford to do it all by yourself and then the roommates just happen to do it for you, that's a better position to be in. So I don't think that that's more of a cautionary tale for people who are listening. I don't think you would ever put yourself in a precarious financial position. Mostly because you're thoughtful about your money. You're thinking ahead. You're not just thinking about today, which is what makes you so awesome, Alex. Thank you. Awesome, Alex. Hey, Alex, thank you so much for talking with us today. I think if you just keep doing what you're doing, man, you're going to be just fine. And feel free to reach out if you ever think we can help out. Yes, sir. Of course. Thank you. Alex, this was super fun talking to you. I really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thanks, you too. All right. Thank you for listening to Forget About Money. And we look forward to talking to you again soon.